Welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Dean Ash from Guthrie, Oklahoma. And I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana. We call ourselves Garden Angelus because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening and we want others to love it too. We are also authors and invite you to check out our books, including my book, The 2030 Something Garden Guide, a no-fuss, down-and-dirty gardening 101 for anyone who wants to grow stuff. And my books, including Potted and Pruned, Homegrown and Handpicked, and Seeded and Sodded, my trilogy of gardening humor, and my new book, Creatures and Critters, Who's in My Garden? You can ask for any of our books at your favorite bookstore or find them online wherever books are sold. Speaking of online, you can also find us as The Garden Angelus on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and occasionally Pinterest. And we'd love for you to join our Facebook group, The Garden Angelus Garden Club. And now on to this week's episode. Hello, Dee. Hello, Carol. How's the garden? The garden is good. Do you want to hear all about it? I'd like an update. Well, since May the 18th, and we're recording this on the 26th, we've gotten over four inches of rain. Wow, that's a lot of rain, even for you guys. Well, I should explain, one of the rainfalls was 2.4 inches all on its own, and then we had 0.98 on Saturday in like two minutes. So it's Yeah, left, that it's, sounds like here. It's left the garden very wet, and so I don't have my seed-sown crops like beans, squash, corn. I don't have those planted. I don't have zinnias sown or marigolds sown, so... Um, I'm making some adjustments. I'm going to, I got to figure this out, but I will. So do you feel super behind or do you think you can catch back up pretty fast? I think I can catch up pretty fast. What is really helping is for the last, I don't know, five or six years, it seems like the peonies bloomed on Mother's Day two weeks ago and everybody's peonies really just opened up yesterday around here. So I feel like the spring is behind I mean, my peas are just now flowering, and normally I would at least have the pods to pick on the like the snow peas and the i the pea pod peas. I forgot the other name for them, but anyway, but they're just now flowering, so I feel like the garden is behind, so that makes me feel better, yeah, um my garden has had a lot of rain this week too, and I would say my roses finished their first flush of bloom and we had the best rose year we've had in a long, long time. But we've had all this rain since, which means black spot's going to be a problem. No, I don't spray. Um, I'm really loving growing my tomatoes in smart pots and in those grassroots bags. And I got a lot of questions about the bags on Instagram. And I also got a lot of questions about the potting soils, which you and I have talked about before, but I'm testing like four different potting soils. And um, at the end of the season, I'll say how everything did. Let me just say this. So far, all the organic potting soils are fabulous. And they've all done really, really well. So not too much nitrogen. I have really good growth on the plants, but not too much nitrogen. So I had a question for you, and I can see on our notes that you read it. I started some potatoes back in March, but then I looked at my pantry last night And I noticed that I have some organic potatoes sprouting in my pantry. This is going to be one of those cases where I tell people, do as I say, don't do as I do. (laughs) Right. Because I'm really thinking about planting those potatoes. First of all, you're not really supposed to plant potatoes from your pantry. But this is a weird year. So I'm going to do it. And I'm going to put them in like a grow bag or something like that, an old one I have. But also, we always tell people that they need to start potatoes really early, right? Not really early, but two to four weeks before your last predicted frost. But here... Yeah. So they can withstand a really light frost once they start growing. But if you get a freeze like we had, it kills them. And so a lot of people lost their potatoes that had planted early. I just planted mine Mm -hmm. last weekend, so mine are coming up. And I did buy uh, potatoes for growing from the from the local greenhouse, and I chitted them. I did too. I so did too. You could grow the. You got organic potatoes that started to sprout, and you planted those. I yeah, think, I think you're fine. I haven't planted them yet. 
I'm thinking about it. So I planted my regular potatoes that I ordered as seed potatoes. I did not chip these because they were tiny to begin with. And they're doing great. They're in a grow bag and they're just growing like crazy. But I thought, why just throw these on the compost pile? I'm going to go ahead and chit them and I'm going to grow them and we'll see how they do. And I was thinking to myself, why are they considered a cold weather crop? I think a lot of it has to do with if you're going to grow full size potatoes, it takes a very long season. It does. It but I don't really, I don't. I don't grow full size potatoes. I, I grow potatoes either. that are small to eat. And I'm just going to grow these and see what happens. Yeah, we're not growing those big uh, russet potatoes for the big bakers. So I'm going to do it and give it a try and we'll go from there. Yeah, I think you'll be fine. And um, what we're growing, I, we always called them new potatoes. Right. And they're just the small ones, and you can just wash them off and eat them skins and all, boil them up with your green beans. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. And you can also take them out of your green beans and just fry them lightly in a little bit of oil, and they are fantastic. The really small ones. I want My grandmother them. used to do that. I want You them. need to have one because they are worth it. Okay, we have a quote. Well, wait, before we have the quote, I, did a, I oh. have to give a shout out. So my sister that has the condo listened to our podcast. And she calls me up Saturday and she says, or Sunday, I forget what day. It doesn't matter. She says, I want a pot of cherry tomatoes on my patio so I can be like Dee and pick my <laughs> cherry tomatoes and eat them. That's funny since you have way more cherry tomatoes than Dee. But yes, I do have two plants on my deck. So I had four leftover cherry tomato plants. And I went over there with an old smart pot. We filled it up with dirt. And I put all four sweet 100s in that pot. So she's going to have so many cherry tomatoes. <laughs> she is. That'll be a delicious tangle of yumminess. But I tell you what, cherry tomatoes plants are a rare, rare breed right now. You cannot find them anywhere. They're sold out everywhere. No. You can't buy them in Oklahoma either. They're sold out. You can't out. buy any transplants of any kind that I've been able to see because people are gardening who have never gar gardened before. I probably could have made good coin on those plants, but I gave them away. There you go. Now I'm ready it's for okay. the quote. All righty. Are you going to do it? I am. I love to prune my roses. That's the one thing I really feel I do pretty well. Other things I usually, because I travel so much, leave to my gardeners who know what I love. But I do love to prune them because you forget everything else. It's like if you're a painter, you can forget everything else while you're doing it. And that's from Julie Andrews. Hmm. That's sweet. And you had kind of an interpretation of what you thought this meant. I have a little different one. To me, this means do what you really love to do in your garden. And then if you can afford to, hire the rest out. <laughs> Yeah, if you need help uh, spreading mulch, I just worked with a lady in Norman about a month, well, about three weeks ago, and we socially distanced and wore masks, people. Um, we, her big thing is she's getting older, and I said, you need to hire some young, strong backs to help you mulch your garden, and she did. But what I took from Julie Andrews' deal is that Gardening, like painting and other types of art, because I think gardening is an art, it takes you out of time and you get to relax. And that's why it's so good for horticultural therapy when people are ill. Yes. And prisoners, people who feel imprisoned. And doesn't everybody feel a little bit imprisoned right now? Yeah, they feel a little imprisoned. Or if you feel like your, your, your schedule just has you trapped, get out in the garden. So we're going to talk about roses today. Yeah, we're going to talk about English roses, David Austin roses. So David Austin died in 2018, but his company lives on and is doing great. And recently, I would say in the last eight years, but especially the last five, great disease-resistant roses are coming out of that company. And one of the ones I planted this year was Lady of Shalott. And Lady of Shalott is supposed to be extremely disease-resistant, as are several others, and um, it's not, I think when David Austin Roses first came out, people treated them a little bit like precious pets, but now you're able to treat them a little bit more like the, what they are, which is shrubs. I don't have any. So I know, I don't know how, 
How cold does it get there? Zone five? Uh, zone six A. Six A. So not bad. Um, yeah, you could definitely grow a few. I still think you need to grow them in an area where they, at least in my state, where they get some protection from wind and where they get some protection from afternoon sun, heavy duty afternoon sun. Right. But they do really well here. And um, that's about all I grow now, excluding South Africa, which is a great grandiflora and not a David Austin rose that I put on my Instagram page yesterday. Um, he had the idea to create shrub roses with old world fragrance, like the old world roses. Right. And also that form, those big double romantic blooms at a time when hybrid teas were a big thing. And so at first he didn't make, he made no money at all. And it was really hard for him to get any attention. Now, if you go to England, if they were having the Chelsea Flower Show this year, he has a huge booth that covers, well, it's a big area. And it was the same way when we were at, he and Peter Beals, both of their companies have huge booths. And so one of his first big breakthrough roses was Graham Thomas, and I still grow it, but it is, but it does have black spots. So try more disease resistant varieties like Desdemona or Claire Rose Austin. Desdemona is a pale, pale pink that fades to white, and Claire Rose Austin is a beautiful, beautiful pink. Those are two really good ones. And you can't, you know, today, hybrid teas, I don't want to say they're extinct, but it is, you, wow. you can't buy them anywhere hardly. You have to mail order those. Nobody's selling those much. They, um, there's a nursery here, a local nursery, TLC, and they still sell some. But the problem with a lot of hybrid teas, not all of them, but a lot of them, they were really designed for being show roses, you know? Right. And show roses, I personally, I have no interest in show roses. Now, I do still grow... Um, a couple, I grow Pretty Lady, which is a hybrid tea. It's one of the Downton Abbey roses. And I grow Anna's Promise, which I also think is a hybrid tea, but I'm not sure. And I did have to order one of those. And the other one I found in Tulsa. Anyway, I'll say this. Pretty Lady is one of the prettiest roses out there, but it's down to one cane. It's about five years old. So ne- it'll have to be pulled out next year, but I'm enjoying it this year. So I think the reason people thought roses were really a fussy plant or fussy plants, was because of the hybrid teas. Right. The hybrid teas, I mean, they are, um, (laughs) yeah, spray, spray, spray. Spray, spray, spray. And in my mind, at least around here, you had to cut them back far enough that you could put a rose cone over them to protect them in the wintertime. And uh, they still might just die back on you. And so I... It just seemed like a lot of fuss for, like you said, a show flower. And if you're not showing the roses, what's the point? Right. And I think people said a lot about the fact that they were repeat blooming. But in Oklahoma, it was a very slow repeat bloom because the middle of summer is too hot to get them to bloom. So I think, you know, roses still get a bad rap from all those years where people drenched everything with pesticides and herbicides. Um, I get a lot of questions all the time about how I grow my roses. This is how I do it. It's not hard. When I plant a new rose, like this year I planted Molino, which is another David Austin. It's an older one, but a good one. I get some back to nature compost and I mix that in with with my soil, which my soil is pretty good now. I mean, I have good soil. I mulch it every year with like fine pine bark and It just gets incorporated back into the soil every year, slowly by the worms. So my soil is really good soil. If you have crummy soil, you're going to have to do a lot more amending. So I do that. And then I also really, really love shredded leaves. And I have a giant leaf shredder that we use to get the leaves off of our little lawnette in the front. I don't shred all the leaves, just a few. And then I love this stuff called Mills Rose Magic, which is a fertilizer that comes out of I think it's out of Georgia. And that Mr. Mills was an exhibition tea, hybrid tea rose grower, and he won a lot of awards. Mills Rose Magic is uh, pretty organic, although I think it does use um, some sewage sludge or something. So keep that in mind. Anyway, I didn't use any fertilizer this year so far. I ordered some Mills Rose Magic just the other day because I didn't want to at first because I didn't want to strain the postal system any more than it already was. But now... I thought I could. 
So at the end of this month, I'm going to feed them. And by feeding them, I mean that loosely. I actually take the fertilizer and throw it at the base of the rose. I don't dig a trench around the roses anymore. I don't do any of that stuff. And then I just put mulch on top. That's all I do. You don't set a little place setting and get it a knife and a fork and a spoon and put a little no. napkin around its neck so that... <laughs> no. No, I don't do that anymore. You do it like you're feeding chickens, right? Like you're feeding chickens. You just throw it. I just throw it down because I figure anything that runs off will go to the daylilies and it'll be fine. And one more thing, I've, asked, I've been asked a lot about rose rosette disease. Yeah, it was a huge problem in my garden, but I haven't seen it for years And if I do see it, I will dig that puppy and throw it in the trash as soon as possible, not the compost pile. But I think I think rose rosette disease has moved on. And I wrote a big post about this and how it was kind of like coronavirus. And it was really serious. And then eventually when people followed protocols, it moved out. So let's hope that coronavirus does the same thing. I will say this about rose rosette. If you didn't shovel prune your roses and get them the heck out of your garden, you lost every rose you had. And I know this for a fact because I know several big rose gardens in Oklahoma that no longer have roses. And that's not, I'm not saying that as a slam because it was in my garden for two years before I knew what it was. So it could happen to anybody. Right. And since I don't grow a lot of roses, I am just like out of the loop on rose rosette in the Indianapolis area or the Midwest. I'm assuming that people had it and took the appropriate measures to eradicate it. Yeah, you just do the best you can. We're going to link to my post on roses on David Austin Roses in our show notes. And um, hopefully that'll give you guys some more information. All right. So I have another quote. I'm ready. A good garden may have some weeds. By Thomas Fuller. With that <laughs> definition, my garden is doing great. So is mine. It has a lot of weeds right now. All that rain? Oh my gosh. I know. I mean, it's crazy. The weeds are rampant. And it rained all afternoon yesterday again. And we're supposed to have rain for two more days. And then next week is supposed to be sunny in 80s all week long. What does that mean, Carol? He's gardening all week. Weeds. Weeds, weeds, and weeds, and weeds, and weeds. Yeah, it does. So Dee will have to be gardening. So in tying in with the theme of roses this week, tried to come up with something from the vegetable garden that would be uh, related. And so there are some people who actually grow roses to get the rose hips, which were a great source of vitamin C. Right. And so here's our advice. Since I don't grow roses for rose hips, I don't think you do too either. I leave them on at the end of the season, but I don't harvest them. I leave them for the birds. So if you're going to harvest them, here's the deal. You want to get a variety that has big hips. And I've seen some, and I'm going to share a picture with you, because you did not go with the Garden Com to Quebec City. I think it was in 2013 or 14 or 15. 14. 14. But we went to a garden that had some roses that had the biggest hips I've ever seen. (laughs) And so... Those would be the kind of roses you would want to get. And you could easily Google roses with big hips and find some varieties. But generally, they're single flowering. (laughs) I laugh every time you say roses with big hips. Because I kind of see this rose and she has big hips. But keep going. So anyway, and you could let them flower. And then around September, stop deadheading them and let the rose hips form. And then once they're nice and big and red, then you could pluck them. And then you can coarsely chop them and then go... Go, maybe our friend, the backyard forager, has an article on using rose hips because I have never really rose, used them. But you can use them in tea. Rose, rose hip tea is really popular. But I was going to say no matter what roses you're growing, stop pruning them. I mean, stop deadheading them in about August because here, because it gets cold and you don't want them to die back anyway. So right. it's okay to leave those hips. Keep going. Well, and then the other thing I was going to say in the rose family, there are there are, and you you found some more information, and you wrote down some stuff, and I thought, she wants me to pronounce all these big words, so we're going to get to that in a minute. But strawberries, peaches, <laughs> almonds, cherries, apples, and quince are all in the rose family, and we've covered strawberries six ways to Sunday, so we're not going to talk about that. But you said that the rose has 2,500 species in more than 90 genera. 
genuses. Genera. Genera. Genuses. Genera. A big, Mm -hmm. important family, you said. And so you, there are four subfamilies. And I thought, oh, yeah. That's smart. (laughs) She wants me to. Actually, actually, I didn't think that, but go for it if you want to. First of all, the family is Rosiaceae, right? Rosiaceae. Rosaceae. 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 Sounds like you have rosacea. Okay, go ahead. Um, so there's the fleshy stone fruits, which would be like peaches, and that's in the Amagdaliodae family. And then okay. <laughs> fruits like apples are in the Malodiae family. And then okay. Rosadiae, I think that's what the roses are in. And then mm. Spirodiae, which is what the, like, Spirea. I didn't do very good wow. with those. I think you did fine. Um, that's all from the Encyclopedia Britannica. And what I found interesting is that even after all these years of growing roses and various rose family things, I was thinking about how important they are. And, like, the word droops, which is that ama. Delay day, I can't say it. Droops, fleshy stone fruits. There are droops on a bunch of our, um, a bunch of our native plants, our native shrubs. Yeah, and one that comes, one that comes to mind immediately is the spice bush. The spice bush, and you can't tell spice when they're little spice bushes. You can't tell whether they're male or female. So if you want to try to have fruits, droops then you've got to get them a bunch of them when they're small. So I have four, but they may all be female or they may all be male and I may not get droops, but at least I'm trying. That's so right. I love that word droops. Well, do you like dry droops? <laughs> dry droops. The Carolina <laughs> silver bell is a tree and I've killed it twice already. It's marginally hardy here. Halesia Carolina. It has what's called a dry uh-huh. droop, <laughs> which I, I don't there know. you go. Anyway. I don't... Anyway, we really got down into the botany today. I don't know. I'll do the next (laughs) quote. A bit of fragrance always clings to the hand that gives you roses, a Chinese proverb, which I think is lovely. Mm, That's beautiful. And that takes us to our bookshelf, which I think that was the perfect quote for this because Pat Lukeman is one of the nicest people we've ever met. She's a blogger. And she wrote a beautiful book called The Roses at the End of the Road. And I read it a couple of years ago when I was on a flight because I had downloaded it to my Kindle. Uh huh. And I couldn't, and I'll be honest, I could not stop reading it. It was that good. So I want to suggest other people read it and um, tell me the name of her blog again. Can you remember? Common Weeder. Common Weeder. I remember. Common Weeder. Pat is a Pat knows more about roses than I do. I yeah, I've talked to Pat a few times. I have not read her book, so um, I'm looking for my next charming read. I think it's going to be that book. Oh, it's very charming, and it's actually a really good story about how she and her husband met, how they bought their home, all the things they did to her home, and that's why it's called the Roses at the End of the Road. But it has a lot of great gardening information in there too. Cool. Well, I'm going to have to check that out. So we have some dirt. We do have some dirt. Uh, Jennifer Jewell's wonderful um, podcast has two rose episodes. At the time when I wrote these notes, there was only one. And it really applies to what we talked about today, The Comfort of Roses with Michael Marriott. And that's on Cultivating Place. And if you guys like roses and if you like David Austin roses, Michael, I talk about Michael in my blog post. Um, He's a huge source of information because he works for David Austin roses. Um, Charming, charming man. Very smart. And um, it's just a lovely, lovely episode. And then she had a second episode, which I did not write down, but it was about, uh, it was another lady who is also writing a book about roses. And that was a wonderful podcast too. We'll have to get the link to that one. So when you you put this in our show notes, I thought, I'm going to listen to that. Did you? I did listen. I did. It's very charming. Yeah, it was very enjoyable. I I listened to it as I walked at the park. 
And it just, I don't know, I just enjoyed it thoroughly. And um, I'm going to try some more. I, I'm going to try some more David Austin roses next year. I got, I may have to make a new bed. So I don't know. We'll see. You, you, you have some space, D. I think you could afford to put in another rose bed. Oh, but see, we don't do rose beds at my house, Carol, because we grow those shrubs as shrubs. And so we just do other plants with them, which is how I like to grow things. I do too. I don't have anything that's like monoculture. I don't either. But I did. I mean, I, he talks about David Austin and he, he talks about the early days that David Austin had to kind of convince people that his roses were worth growing. And now, like you said, the hybrid teas are almost gone. I don't want to say extinct, but people don't buy, nobody buys hybrid teas anymore. Well, a few people do because there's still people who exhibit roses. But you can exhibit other ro- other other classes of rose too. But um, and I think sometimes people fall in love with a particular rose, like the peace rose that was featured on Gardener's World the other day. And people still grow the peace rose because it has such an amazing history. It is a it is not the easiest rose right. to grow though. It has a lot of black spot problems. Or they might decide, hey, I'm going to grow all the roses that are named for presidents. Like there's an Abraham Lincoln that's like a real deep red. There's a John Kennedy. I don't know what color that one is. It's white. It starts out green and turns to white. There's a Dwight Eisenhower. Um, I think Dwight Eisenhower's is red, but I don't remember. So anyway, but people kind of get themes and they decide, well, I'm going to grow all the presidents or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) I I can't imagine trying to grow a rose for that reason because it it's too much too much work, you know? Well, I'm just saying there's reasons people grow hybrid teas. Ours is not to question why. <laughs> Ours is just to support people in whatever manner of gardening they want to do. Absolutely. And by the way, President Eisenhower's rose is red. So Which reminds me the yes. you know cabbage roses yes because they're like great big full of petals petals mm-hmm. d my cabbages out there are the best i've ever grown not roses cabbages because i put the horticultural cloth over them so they're not getting bitten mm-hmm. up by eaten up by the uh, little green worms of the european cabbage moth butterfly yeah hate her uh huh so cool. I I've never the cloth, really grown cabbage very well. I cl- pulled the cloth back to weed under there because there's a lot of dill coming up. And I thought, oh, these are the prettiest I've ever grown. Yeah, because the stupid moths can't get to them or butterfly, whatever it is. Um, also, you know what I'm doing? I'm doing, um, we're just having a little chat here at the end of our wrap up that was totally impromptu. I'm using that Vegapod that I won last year in a contest. Uh And it has a big cover that fits on it with clips. And I'm growing all of my summer squash under it to see if I can ward off the squash bugs. Ooh, this is exciting. Wish wish me luck because I grow all my veggies organically. And so I don't spray and I don't use seven dust. There you go. So I don't have much. I don't have much squash. So we're going to give this a try. Well, good. Well, we're going to wrap this up now because it hasn't started raining. The sun is still kind of out. And I think that I could maybe sow seeds for beans and squash yet today. Woohoo! So we want to thank everyone for listening to The Garden Angelist. If you like our podcast, please, please, please tell your friends about us. And if you listen on Apple Podcasts, we'd appreciate a five-star review. That helps us get noticed by others and Apple's algorithm. Yes, and be sure and check out our show notes for links for more information about today's topics, plus links to our own websites. It was lovely to chat with all of you over the Garden Gate today. Bye until next week. Bye.